Given the topic of the video, a warning is in order. For a minority of people, having the notion of free will challenge can be psychologically destabilizing. So if you are that person, you might want to skip this one. But for most people, it has the opposite effect. It's relieving to realize the illusion of being in the driver's seat. I've put in deliberate effort to make sure this video is comprehensible to the general audience. Even those that have never dipped their feet in philosophical ideas um, should be able to follow along with ease. Alright, so we all have this sense of control, like we're the ones steering the wheel of our lives. It's why you dwell on your past mistakes, thinking you could have responded differently to a situation. But here's the kicker. If somehow you could rewind the state of the universe to how it was when you said that dumb thing, you'd repeat exactly the same thing down to every last syllable. You're not alone in holding the belief you have complete control over your actions. This belief is shared globally across different cultures. It's fundamental to who we are as humans. So much so that the entire justice system is based on the premise that individuals bear full responsibility for their actions, especially when committing a crime. I mean, it's the reason you are enraged when the person you already hate does the thing that makes you hate them even more. You act as though they have a choice in not doing those things. But as I'll explain, if they acted any differently, they would be up against the laws of nature itself. In so far as they piss you off, the laws of nature bound them to act that way. Just so I'm not talking at cross purposes to your logic, I need to lay down the foundation for my points to get across. Alright, so our universe operates under certain inflexible laws that are quite literally woven into the very fabric of reality. These are the same laws that make an apple fall from a tree. Or the action of walking, which at its most basic is a controlled fall. All these laws are both universal and constant. What's bizarre is that somehow most people seem to think that these laws cease to operate beyond the barrier of the skin. People think our brains operate independent of these laws. Let's take the domino effect to drop the foundation for my argument. It's a widely known phenomena of cause and effect. A sequence of dominoes carefully arranged, standing upright and spaced precisely. When the first domino is gently nudged, it tips over and triggers a chain reaction, creating a cascade of cause and effect. The domino effect isn't merely an abstract idea. It encapsulates the very essence of causality in an easy to understand manner. It mirrors the interconnectedness of events in the universe, where every action is a reaction to a set of previous events. The laws of the universe are such that if you left a domino untouched until the end of time, it would never move. For any element in the universe to change its state, there has to be another element affecting it. That's why if a lightning strikes a tree, it catches fire. If you plug in your phone to the outlet, it'll charge up. And if you indulge in a lot of beans, you'll unleash some nuclear farts. You can consistently predict the effect if you know the cause. So much like these dominoes, our lives are woven into a complex web of cause and effect. Every decision, every one of our actions is a response to a series of preceding events. To act any differently would require us to be in defiance of the universal laws. Despite our instinctual inclination to believe our actions can't be predicted, like that of the fate of the last domino, we couldn't be any more predictable than we already are. Our biology neatly aligns with the laws of physics. Alright, now this is gonna blow your fucking mind. There was a study where a participants' decision to press a button with either their left or right hand was predicted by up to 10 seconds before they consciously chose which hand to use. Apparently, their brains had already made the decision about which hand to use to press the button with, before they'd even decided which one to hit it with. This was observed through brain imaging machines. This study was pivotal in unraveling the inner workings of our brains. It fundamentally challenges our understanding of decision-making processes. The study was pretty straightforward in that the participants were tasked with a simple action pressing a button with one of their hands. We would have been able to predict more than just a hand movement if it wasn't for the limitations in our current understanding of how the brain works. But as our brain mapping technology advances, we'll be able to conclusively demonstrate that our perception of making choices is nothing but an illusion after all. I'm talking about our ability to precisely predict what someone will say, down to each word, and all this before they even think of it. But the truth is, you don't need a study like that to tell you you don't have free will. Because it's already subjectively obvious if you pay close enough attention to how our thoughts arise. Let's try something fun. Um, think of a number between 1 and 3000. This is your chance to pick any number you want. If there's no free will here, it's not anywhere. 
So I want you to think of a number with as much free will as you think you have. You can even pause this video and take as long as you need. Now if you're done picking the number, reflect on how that number popped into your head. I'm willing to bet you didn't think through each number from 1 to 3000 before making your decision. If you're anything like me, you probably thought of a few numbers and then decided to go with one by giving one of them a story to make it relevant and meaningful. For instance, you could have justified to go with it based on it being your favorite basketball player's jersey number. Or it could have been your father age when he died. Or maybe you simply thought of one completely random number and went with it without much deliberation. But if you inspected how that number came to your mind, you'd be mystified. Now if you thought of a few numbers and then went back and forth between them to decide on the one, creates the illusion of free will when in fact your conscious self wasn't what chose the final number. The commonly overlooked fact is that you didn't consider every single number in the range. So how are you free to choose that which did not even occur to you? Let's take apart this whole process so you can understand what I'm talking about. You didn't know the number you were going to pick beforehand. That would have required forethought of the number you were going to pick. So if you didn't have any prior knowledge of the number you were going to choose, at what part along the process of choosing the number did that number come to you from? And who decided it ultimately? Where did it come from in your head? Look, you could have picked 2435. Why didn't you select this number? Matter of fact, I don't even know where this number just came in my head from. It just did and I went with it. Anyways, to go back to the point, I'm certain that this number didn't even cross your mind. So how are you free to pick it if you didn't even consider it? This number was well within the range of numbers you were free to pick, wasn't it? Yet, you didn't even think of it. Here's the thing, you couldn't have thought of this number no matter what. Thinking of this particular number would have required you to violate the laws of physics. Because the positioning of every atom in your brain was such that you could only have thought of what you did and nothing else. The synopsis in the brain that took place when you were thinking of a number generated the specific number due to factors attributed to your genetics, the environment, and your past experiences. All these factors are well beyond your control and by a good measure at that. I hope you realize you didn't choose the brain you have, nor did you decide your intelligence level, and you didn't choose your environment either. You don't decide what your thoughts are going to be before they arise. You have no idea what you will think of in 10 minutes. For all you know, you might see a picture on the internet that triggers memories of your childhood and if it does evoke those memories you don't decide beforehand whether to let it happen to you or not you just experience it like watching a movie my point is your thoughts are out of your control and that's why you didn't think of 2435 now before you go down into the comment section to say that i picked this number because it's meaningful to me i picked this number because it's my lucky number but here's the thing you could say the same thing about any other number you could have picked why didn't you think of the number corresponding to the year you were born. That's a big one, isn't it? Your whole life is rooted in that year. Or what about your current age? Why didn't that pop into your head? The fact of the matter is your brain only thought of the number it did because it just did. You don't know why it did what it did. You were not free to pick any other number because the connections in your brain didn't fire in a way to make the associations for allowing you to have thought of them. Even your reasoning for the number you picked wasn't in your control. Don't take this to mean that everything in the brain is just happening and it's all random. It's not. There's no such thing as randomness. Since the inception of the universe, you were always destined to pick the number you did. Everything that's happened since the dawn of time happened because of cause and effect. Every atom was displaced by another atom, like balls on an eight ball pool. This line of reasoning makes it possible to predict the future with 100% accuracy. The universe is not random. It functions according to laws that are constant through time and space. So in theory, if we had sufficient knowledge to build a scanner that could map everything down to the atomic level, we'd be able to calculate the next sequence of events based on the momentum of the current state of the universe. We already do this to some extent with the weather. Based on the current atmosphere, Atmosphere, we can infer what the weather is going to be in the future. And this is possible despite a low resolution image of the earth. Suffice it to say, the neurons that fired in your brain at the time of thinking of a number were out of your control. They fired in a way they did because of the state of the universe in your head at the time. So if you were to rewind the time to pick the number again, you'd pick the same number a billion times over. You could test this with another game. Think of three four letter words that start with the letter B and ask yourself why only those words made themselves known to you when you know a lot more than the words that you thought of. Also, why did they occur to you in the order they did? Why didn't you think of the third word first and the first word last? All these words were in your head yet you couldn't choose their sequence. By the way, if this is your first first time ever considering this subject, I hope you're at least starting to experience some cognitive dissonance because that's the objective of the video. The thing is, people think the process of decision making lends credence to free will, 
But the truth couldn't be further from that belief. If you sit down and think about what you should do in a certain situation, you're gonna have to draw up on your existing knowledge and past experiences to make an educated decision. That means you're bound by three things. What you know, how much of it you remember, and how you process that information. You can't anticipate what your decision is going to be before you make it. And when you're done deciding after taking into consideration all the relevant information, you're not free to make any other decision than the one you already made. Let me break it down for you. Let's say you're deciding on whether to jump into that river in front of you for a quick swim or not. But here are some of the things that will guide your decision. You only ever swam in a swimming pool, so you don't have any skills to fight the outgoing current of the river. You know you're susceptible to panic attacks in stressful situations. Additionally, the river ends in a waterfall that's dangerously high. So you're not free to reach any other conclusion than it's not safe for you to dive in. I'm keeping it simple for the sake of the example, otherwise you could throw in a few more factors like you're suicidal or risk seeking by temperament. So obviously these additional factors would influence your decision, but absent any cognitive abnormalities, your decision is restricted by your reasoning. It's similar to how you're not free to not believe 1 plus 1 equals 2. And it's the same with the opposite. If for some strange reason you don't understand it, in that case you are not free to understand it. At this point it's undeniable, you're a slave to your biology. Some hard-headed people like to claim they're not influenced by the world around them. But we know from vast scientific literature that we make up tales to explain our choices. There have been studies conducted that have conclusively demonstrated time and time again how susceptible people are to subliminal messaging. In these studies, the subjects were coerced into making a predetermined choice. Meanwhile, the subjects were firm in their belief that they were making their choices of their own volition without any external influence. But unbeknownst to them, they were making the exact choices the conductors of the study wanted them to make. It's comedic how easy it is to plant seeds in people's heads by feeding them subtle cues without them even realizing. When the subjects were subsequently asked why they chose that option, they had an elaborate story prepared, but in actuality, their story had no bearing on what actually influenced their decision. This particular study has been replicated several times with the same results. The conclusion was that by controlling for the environment, you can consistently manipulate a person into picking a predetermined option. After this study came out, Advertisers started paying exorbitant amounts for the placement of subliminal advertising in movies because of how effective it is. In preparation for this video, I read a lot of counterpoints to my position, but most of them were making the point of a subjective sense of free will. The only valid argument critics of determinism like to bring up is quantum physics. By the way, determinism is a philosophical jargon for cause and effect. Anyway, the truth is, we don't know much about how quantum physics works. The fact is, quantum physics is irrelevant to free will. Our brains work deterministically just like every other object in the universe. Let me prove it to you. We can reliably induce a certain state of mind with certain drugs. The reason why cocaine or heroin or any other drug works on the brain is because the brain is an organ much like any other that is subservient to cause and effect. People find it hard to believe that the laws of the universe don't stop working at the barrier of the skull. But the fact is, if the brain was truly independent and not subjected to cause and effect, mind-altering drugs wouldn't have any effect on the brain. But as you and I both know, they do. We can make people euphoric by giving them MDMA. Ecstasy only works the way it does because your brain is a ball of chemicals that reacts to other chemicals and invokes a blissful state of mind. Okay, this next case is a ruthless indictment of the notion of free will. Consider the case of Phineas Gage, a 19th century railroad worker who suffered severe brain damage after an accident involving an iron rod. Following the injury, his personality changed drastically. He became more impulsive, less inhibited, and less able to plan ahead. This dramatic shift in personality was a direct consequence of having his brain structure changed. So we can infer from this that the physical structure of the brain has to do with our actions and thoughts. Another instance of the brain structure being the cause of your actions is in the case of Charles Whitman. He went on a rampage and killed 14 people while injuring 31 before being neutralized. He wrote a final note requesting an autopsy of his brain after his death. He mentioned he didn't understand why he felt the urge to commit the horrific crimes. Lo and behold, the autopsy revealed he had glioblastoma pressing on his amygdala. That's the part of the brain involved in emotions and behavior. To be clear, I'm not justifying his heinous crimes, but his medical condition is vital in understanding why he did what he did. 
He had a ticking time bomb in his head, for God's sake. Any reasonable judge would conclude he was a victim of his biology and wasn't committing those horrible acts of his own free will. Now, conveniently, people like to think of the tumor as something that doesn't really belong to the person. People realize the placement of the tumor in his brain was out of his control. Yet, there's a disparity in the empathy we extend to other criminals. We empathize with someone with a visible brain abnormality, but struggle to extend that same understanding to a murderer without such abnormalities. I would argue a murderer with no tumor bears a similar level of culpability for their actions as Charles Whitman did for his. Let me unpack that. Every cell in your body is arranged in a way that is beyond your control. If you could choose the placement of each cell in the body, there will be zero ugly people in the world. We would all make ourselves perfectly symmetrical. The same goes for our brain cells. We'd give ourselves photographic memory if we had a choice. But instead, we are who we are. We're the mercy of nature, merely observing our thoughts and actions. So when a serial psychopath feels an inexplicable urge to commit yet another murder, they're not in control. It's an unfortunate arrangement of neural structure that haunts their existence. It's akin to suddenly finding oneself attracted to children. It's not a choice. It's a circumstance of nature. I should clarify myself. I'm trying to make a point. I'm not suggesting we should be lenient on these criminals as a result of their unfortunate biology. Threatening them with prison time or even capital punishment acts as a strong and effective deterrent for other people. It's the external push they need to resist acting on their urges. Think about how a motivational clip can inspire you to start working out. Without it, you might not have the willpower to do it. The external stimulus alters your state of mind. It's all because of cause and effect. Other things outside of you can have a significant impact on what is inside of you. That's where the prospect of punishment works. See, both things can be true at once. You can understand how it's not the criminal's fault in committing those evil acts, and at the same time realize it's necessary to give him the harshest punishment possible, to be made an example out of, to deter other people with similar brain wiring from going down the same path. Our whole bodies work deterministically. That's why an AI model can detect a heart attack 10 years before it happens. If this isn't evidence of us being clockwork winding down, I don't know what is. Scientists can predict with a remarkable degree of certainty as to what kind of cancer you'll have 50 years before it happens by your blood work and phenotype. As we learn more about our biology, the more it points to how shackled our fate is to cause and effect. Despite the complexities of the brain, we conduct ourselves predictably as proven by psychology. Human behavior has been studied for centuries and compounding on the discoveries of behavioral psychologists over the last few centuries, we have a good understanding of how most people would act in a certain situation. The big five personality traits, also known as the five factor model, are a widely accepted framework used to describe human temperament. These traits encapsulate various dimensions of individual personality. You can generally accurately extrapolate a person's personality and their political leanings from which combination of the big five they embody. Someone who is high in openness and high in neuroticism would generally fall on the left side of the political spectrum, while someone who is conscientious and agreeable would lean more to the right. There was a scandal with Facebook during the 2016 US presidential election where a company by the name of Cambridge Analytica harvested user data of millions of Americans to study their behavior online and serve them targeted ads to sway their vote to elect a preferred candidate. The whole operation was so effective that the United States Congress launched an investigation into Facebook for influencing the election. And they summoned Mark Zuckerberg to grill him for allowing third parties to access user data. Now, this whole operation was incredibly sophisticated in studying human behavior and correctly predicting what kinds of ads would change the minds of people to vote for a selected political figure. The thing to note is that this whole scandal happened almost a decade ago. Today, these social media companies are orders of magnitude better at predicting human behavior because of years of data on human psychology. That's why X and TikTok work as effectively as they do. Algorithms only work as well as they do because you're not free to not like what your brain finds interesting. If you like watching videos of people getting pranked, you're not free to not enjoy those videos. You don't choose to enjoy them. Your brain reacts involuntarily to different kinds of things. Each person's feed on their social media platform is specifically tailored to their liking, and that's what keeps each user hooked for hours. All of this is possible because our interests are laughably predictable for these companies, and that's how they personalize your feed to your interests. Your interests aren't decided by you. Let's say you're interested in and watching people pop zits on their faces. You don't sit there contemplating whether to find it interesting or not. You either do or you don't. Same is the case with every niche interest of yours. You laugh at a joke because your brain finds it funny. If you were forcing the laugh, you'd be faking it. It's only genuine so far as it's involuntary. 
Same with tears, you cry only because of an overwhelming emotion. If you could control your brain, you choose to always be ecstatic. You'd never make yourself experience a negative emotion or boredom for that matter. All these states of minds are part of the human experience and they can't be manufactured or induced on command. They arise and subside as a result of both environmental and genetic factors. You merely notice and experience them without any free will. There was a study done on judges and their rulings based on the time of day. What they found out was that judges gave out lenient sentences right after lunch and the strictest sentences right before lunch. The results were consistent across all types of judges. So basically after judges were satiated, they were in a good mood and went easy on the defendants. When the judges were presented with the evidence, they were both surprised and embarrassed by their inconsistency in their rulings. This is yet another example of how we are influenced by external factors. The analogy that comes to mind for thinking you're in charge is that of a magician performing a trick with a volunteer from his audience. You know the volunteer thinks she's in control of the situation when asked upon to draw a card. But unbeknownst to the volunteer, she's doing exactly what the magician wants her to do. Our brains work similar to this. We think we're the ones calling the shots, but we're merely stringing along with what's already been decided by the brain. If you were the one in charge, you'd work out every day and build a muscular body, but you can't summon the willpower to do that. How is it that some people have the willpower to do it while others don't? What gives some people the willpower? It's, it's a luck of the draw. It's all biology and the environment. It's the same with movies. Two people can watch the same movie and have a completely different reaction to how good the movie was. One will think that it was a masterpiece and the other think it was a complete waste of his time. It's because even the slightest variation in DNA and their past life experiences results in varying degrees of interest in art. The environment you're born in results in what religion you follow or lack thereof. You can also generally predict what someone's socioeconomic status is based on where they live. The poorest state in contiguous United States is Mississippi and the poorest town is Yazoo City. People there are poor not because they want to be, but because of environmental factors that have remained static over generations. Alright, let me tell you an interesting anecdote. A few days ago, I was running some errands, and on my way back home, I drove well over the limit. Now, I'm someone who's a boringly slow driver because I'm aware of how common fatal traffic accidents are. Yet something came over me and I revved up my motorcycle because I wanted the rush. After I reached home, I thought to myself how out of character it was for me. I rode that fast against my better judgment. I didn't think about how fatal it could have been while riding. I mean, I watched some gruesome videos of people being mangled in traffic accidents in the past. Yet those scenes didn't flash in my brain at the time. If they had, I guarantee you, I wouldn't have raced my motorcycle. The real cause of my action in the brain was out of my control. Look, I'm not trying to deflect responsibilities for my actions. I, I understand it could have gone horribly wrong. I'm merely stating facts at the level of neurons. Okay, so this example might throw you for a loop, but it's true. Even the act of talking is involuntary. You don't know what you're going to say next. The words just appear in your consciousness. It's not like you're sitting there thinking, this is what I'm going to say next. You just speak and hope you don't make incoherent noises. Sometimes you make senseless arguments and your phrasing is off, or maybe you just misspeak. Who's in charge of your brain at those times? You conveniently label those as brain farts. Why is it that when you say something intelligent, it's you who's making the argument? Whereas when you accidentally pronounce a word wrong, you dismiss it as a gasp. Also, why is it that when you write something down, you are far better at collecting your thoughts in a concise manner? Yet when you speak, you can't find the same arrangement of words on the fly. It's your brain forming the sentences in both those instances. Yet somehow the written arrangement of words is inaccessible to you on a whim, even though it's in your brain somewhere. You're only as free to choose what comes out of your mouth as the state of the universe in the brain will allow you. You know that feeling when you realize you're running on autopilot, especially when you take the same path to your destination as always. That's one of the few times when it's blatantly obvious that your brain is making the decisions about which corner to turn. But that's how you're like all the time, you just don't realize it. Okay, so this is it for the video. I hope you were at least able to understand 30% of my points. I would consider that a success. But if you didn't, I can't blame you because you're not the one who chose not to understand it. You just didn't. And on the other hand, if you understood everything I said, that's not your fault either, you just did. It takes a lot of brain power and uh, mental energy to produce these videos. I spent around 23 days reading both sides of the argument. So it took me a lot of time to make this video, not to mention how much time it's gonna take me to edit this whole thing out. So please consider supporting me or just follow me on X.